Hello, and welcome back to Articulate with Steve McJones. It's me, what's up? It's, it's your boy, it's your boy Steve, what's going on? Welcome back. This episode is an interesting one for me to put together because it's ironic, I've, I've been having trouble kind of figuring out the right way to articulate these ideas and concepts that I've been kind of putting together and struggling with a little bit. So the way that I think I'm going to do it, the best way that I think to get what I'm trying to say across is to just kind of go over how I figured it out, basically, and the conclusion that I came to in the end. Um, so to start with, these ideas kind of came to light because of personally, um, you know, I'm getting into this job now and kind of doing the thing with my stand up and, you know, fully getting vested in life. And the interesting thing is, you know, my whole life I've been working up to this point, you know, you go to college and even before then it's like, well, I want to do stand up. So it's like my whole life I've been thinking about the point where I finally get to do what I want to do, make the money and do the stand up thing. And that's kind of where I'm at right now with some hitches along the way, of course, but uh, it, it's, it's interesting to finally get here um, because now that I'm here, I still obviously run into a lot of the same problems that I've had before mentally, you know what I mean? I still get low just like anybody does and I still have my highs and I still struggle with discipline and, and, and you know, all these things and the idea of improvement and the idea of meaning, uh, which is actually kind of one of my biggest, one of my biggest like mental conflicts, I guess, that I work with uh, and work against. There's just, when I get low, I get to this point where I'm like, why does any of this even matter? And, um, you know, and, and I found out about myself that I actually enjoy looking into things like that. That's why I read philosophy and psychology books and blah, 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 uh, which is actually kind of some of the ideas that I wanted to explore today to tie some things together and, like I said, get to the conclusion that I kind of came to. So um, a lot of these ideas come from a few main sources. Um, I think the biggest one uh, that I took a lot from was this video on YouTube. Um, it's like an Alan Watts lesson called Why the Need to Improve. Uh, he calls it Mind Over Mind. I also bring some ideas from Adam Curtis's docu-series called Can't Get You Out of My Head, Carl Jung's book Modern Man in Search of a Soul, um, The Big Lebowski, some, you know, I, I, there's just some ideology that I reference throughout it that, you know, I just want to let you know that, I mean, obviously, nothing is original nowadays, but I'm pulling from a lot of sources and um, trying to kind of create a concept that I explore myself. So getting into it, um, one of the hardest things to articulate is the, it, it, it's the tie between religion and the mental process. Because, you know, you have this idea of religion growing up, at least for me, I grew up Catholic, and I got instilled with this idea of like a physical, you know, white man with a beard in the sky, and like a physical heaven and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then you kind of grow up to be a teen and you're like, well, that sounds fake. And you start to actually mature like mentally and realize that, hey, maybe there is um, some sort of uh, like in, in if, if you've seen the movie in Bruges, um, there's the idea that, you know, where you end up on this life, you know, in this earth is an outcome based on the decisions that you made previously. Um, so in a way, you know, maybe that's like a mental heaven or a mental hell. And kind of connecting those those ties is, is a really interesting concept to explore. So I think within that, to start the connection, I guess, is the idea that Jung actually explores in the book uh, that starts out with just the basic idea of having neurosis. Uh, neurosis is an umbrella term used for people that just have any mental issues, basically, which I think pretty much everybody does nowadays. Nobody's perfect, right? So the idea of coming to terms with your neurosis, whether that be depression, anxiety, literally any sort of um, mental thing that can hold you back, and I mean that also includes addiction, uh, actual eating disorders, uh, you know, all that good stuff. But it starts out with this idea of neurosis, and um, for him, you know, he, based on his experience with patients, there seems to be 
obviously everybody's different and there's different types of people moving through it, right? So it starts out with the simple patients, as he calls them. The people that you reveal in life, you have to come across this conclusion, this realization that you have bad thoughts. You make bad decisions. Everybody does. Everybody has terrible things that go through their mind <laughs> and some people act on them whether willingly or non-willingly. It's just the way of the human experience. Uh, like I said, nobody's perfect. We all have flaws. And, you know, you can reflect and be like, wow, that was a mistake I made, but you did make it, you know. And so coming to terms with the idea that there is an entire subconscious that has, that plays a large factor in your decision-making processes, right? While we all would like to think that we try to hold ourselves to the best moral standards, uh, we don't always act on the best moral standards. I'd actually like to go ahead and make my first Can't Get You Out of My Head uh, docu-series reference. Adam Curtis talks about these scientists and psychologists back in uh, the 1900s that actually started looking into the brain process. Um, and the way they started was looking and observing how human eyes uh, react to certain questions. And, you know, th they did a close up because the eye is like directly connected to the brain. And it's almost like an ex you, you don't have any uh, control over how your pupils move typically. And th the idea is that it is a direct signal of what the brain is doing and how it's working. So, um, which actually made way for the research that I'm trying to reference by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, his research, uh, actually, he ended up winning a Nobel Prize. I'm not sure if it's for this theory, but he has this theory. Like, the brain has so much going on subconsciously that, like, the actual amount of data that our brain processes is, like, hundreds of times the amount of which we what we actually experience. So the point being... The, the things that we see and we experience is really just, uh, it's how we accept our reality because we have to put everything that we're experiencing into something we can understand um, with the little bit of, of the brain that we're using. And the way that works is just the, the overarching theme of this is that we don't really have, uh, well, first of all, that there could be so much more going on than what we're even acknowledging or experiencing just beyond our fourth dimensional lifestyles, I guess. But it, it, it works in a way where he, the, the question that stands after the research is, do we actually have any control over what decisions we make and what we actually end up doing? Because, um, you, you know, like I, getting back to it, we aren't perfect. We, we make flawed decisions. So while we would like to hold ourselves to a higher standard, there's just things that we can't explain that come from our subconscious that that guide us and move us and make us do certain things. So again, kind of getting back to the, the process is coming to terms with the idea, one, that we are flawed. And there's simple patience, as Jung likes to call them, that where all you have to do is expose this truth, right? Expose the idea that uh, we aren't perfect. And all it takes for them, you know, within religion is to just go to confession. Just confess, say that you realize that there's a beast within you, and then acknowledge that you don't identify with that beast. And uh, and that's enough for some people. Uh, I, wish, I wish that was enough for me. Uh, I wish I could live in, you know, that ignorance is bliss mindset, but it uh, it's not. And, and that leads into the next level of patience beyond the simple patience. So you have this realization of the that entire subconscious, and then you get these patients who become after the confession stage. It's it's not it's almost not enough, you know. They they understand it and they get. Uh, they, he calls it transference, where he, they transfer their neurosis into the idea of being attached to the process of figuring out their neurosis and, and actually uh, being amazed by somebody like the psychoanalysis that helps them or like getting too obsessed with the therapist and the idea that like, wow, like, wow, you know, I, I have to, so many things to work through and like just too obsessed with how it all works. See here most of the early episodes of Articulate with Steve McJones, but the, the best outcome uh, after that stage is deciding 
okay, realizing that that subconscious makes those shitty decisions sometimes and moving on. But the thing is, the best outcome is realizing those things and then moving forward, using them as like a moral guidance to understand and realize that you make those shitty decisions. But after you make them moving forward, be more successful within your own thinking and, and which we'll kind of get back to. Um, but to finish kind of what Young's research was, the point of that was, you know, once you have that realization to use that as a moral guidance, then from there you realize that it's kind of pointless because you can't change. Um, and this is where, you know, the, the ideology of, of chasing power and pleasure come into play because you get lost in the meaninglessness because you realize that you can't change. So you try to change and you get towards, uh, you, you move towards pleasure and power to have influence and try to help other people or pleasure to distract yourself in your own best interest, which again, I mean, I mean, that's not a bad ideology to have because once you get to that point, there's not, you can't go back and just be ignorant of how your mental processes work. Again, second reference of the Can't Get You Out of My Head uh, docu-series by Adam Curtis. I love, there's a, a microcosmic example. Um, I mean, he ties so many different themes and topics together in this docu-series. But one that I really, uh, that brought a lot of ideas to light for me um, was this idea of one Mr. Michael X. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the fella, but he was actually... He, he kind of took uh, Malcolm X's thing and, and led the Black Panther Revolution in London. Um, my friend and I, it's like a Rick and Morty bit where there's a, a Michael and a Pykel. Cooking a little bit of this, I'm going to cook a little bit of that. Oh, oh, oh hey, uh, stop tugging, Michael. You quit tugging, I, I, I'm in the middle of my news. Oh, oh, it's always about you, isn't it? Can you believe this guy, ladies and gentlemen? He's got his own news show, he's got a normal name. You can tell our parents started with naming with him. It's like, oh, Michael, I had, they had that one planned before they even got pregnant, I bet. And then they found out I was attached along for the ride, and they said, ah, shit. Well, just fuck it. Call him Pykel. Fuck you, Pykel. You're a fucking piece of shit. But, uh, so Pykel X, right? He leads the Black Panther Revolution in the 60s uh, in London, right? Um, and again, this is, there's a lot more that goes into this as, like, a, a cohesive piece. But again, this is a microcosm, and then I'll kind of expand on it a little bit but he in the 60s led the black panther revolution in london and ended up doing something that he got in jail for obviously you know probably something stupid then but then got out after quite a while in jail and got back into the revolution and kind of things the world had been moving along at that point i was just talking about this with a friend on the phone and i specifically remember learning about the the back end of the 60s, uh, about the revolutionary period and ideology within civil rights, but also, you know, the Vietnam War, uh, Watergate was a big thing back then, and kind of working to revolutionize and make the world a better place. And I mean, it wasn't just in America during that period, there was a whole revolutionary period within China and um, Russia and, you know, everywhere. There was, it was literally like a worldwide ideology shift of, you know, people want to make the world a better place. And coming back to the, the smaller example of uh, Michael X, so he gets out of jail, uh, and before it was this revolutionary world. Um, but at that point, when he got out, the world started turning into more of, you know, into the 70s decades, where there was actually a, a major realization where they, I, like I said, I remember learning about this revolutionary period, but I don't remember how it ended, right? And this is what the Adam Curtis documentary kind of brought me back to is that people started realizing that revolutions don't work. Like if there was a revolution that worked, point it out to me, tell me what it was, because they all had, you know, some good consequences, but also very bad consequences. I mean, something that you think is right now or the ideology that you think um, should lead the way everybody thinks is, you know, it's a whole thing to get into. But so Michael X gets out of prison and kind of realizes people are shifting from the revolutionary mindset into more of a individualism mindset, which meaning you can't change the world. So you kind of try to look inward and try to discover yourself to be that better person so that you can change the world on 
a scale that is realistic to you. Um, and that kind of goes with like the 70s exploring uh, mind altering drugs and mind expanding drugs and all, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, and it, and it kind of goes from there into like the 80s and the 90s and that ideology kind of dying out. But before we get there, uh, Michael X sees this and realizes that, you know, his revolution just is probably not going to work out. There's actually a story where he got John Lennon and Yoko Ono to donate their hair to the cause. Um, not, not in like a sexual way, of course, of course, not in a sexual way, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like a big deal because it's John Lennon and Yoko and, uh, they donate their hair to the cause and what uh, Michael X ends up doing is he sells it for money, right? Uh, again, not a sexual thing in any way, but he just entirely pockets the money himself when it could have gone towards the, the revolution or the, the project, the Black Panther group and, you know, he, he just ended up being a con man and, you know, it's a whole thing. So the idea that I kind of get from that story, first of all, it's really sad. It's very sad realization that revolution doesn't actually help anything. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I still think the idea of trying to change the world for a better place is something worth doing just because... There are so many negative forces that are trying to make it a worse place, so you got to counteract that somehow. But the the point is there, you know, there was a mass, a huge movement uh, of that ideology of of again, it, it's this is the concept that I'm trying to explore a little bit. Like, is the idea of having a meaningful life and trying to change things for the best, um, whether that be internally or externally. And I think everybody wants to do that. I think that's kind of our goal as human beings is to try to be the change you wish to see in the world, right? Like that's kind of the bigger thing. Um, and so this is where I'm kind of going to tie in again. It's it's This is the hardest thing for me is tying together the idea of the psychoanalysis and mental processes to the idea of religion. Because what that starts with is the need or the the pull you feel towards being the best you you can be to change yourself for the better and to change the world for the better. A lot of people do that through religion, right? So like I said, you know, you start with religion as this idea of uh, like a physical man in in the sky that floats around and has a good time. They have beer and probably drugs in heaven, right? Like if it wouldn't be a good heaven without some, some drugs and alcohol, of course. But then you move towards the thing where you realize that's probably not a reality, but it, you know, very well, maybe, who am I to say? But then religion, as you move forward, becomes more of a guiding mental process uh, with rules that are supposed to help you mentally, right? And the idea being that you move towards this better place, this better, you know, towards a God or towards a heaven, towards something that you can live peacefully and happily in you know that's interior like mentally right but also exterior he relates it you know that's kind of the idea of heaven within the christian based religions but he uh, alan watts in this lesson references as well the hindu ideology but it, it's more of like an eastern based religious experience where the idea of heaven is almost it, it, it's the idea of meditation right so when you meditate, you take a step back from your thoughts. And so the goal is to completely separate from all of, I mean, yes, all the good and bad thoughts, but mostly separate from those thoughts and identify with a higher self. Identifying with the self that is not having those good and bad thoughts, with the self that uh, watches those thoughts, right? And, and, it, it, it's kind of hard to explain. So it's, again, it's basically trying to make the connection between the two. Um, the idea within like a Christian westernized based religion is, again, you're trying to get to this heaven, right? You're trying to get to this place where you don't identify with the bad choices you make and you identify with the grace of God is per, per se, you know? <laughs> and, and the funny thing is that he mentions is that in itself to identify with God or, you know, a perfect being that makes no bad decisions is a sin in itself, right? 
and the equivalent of that with the Eastern religious idea uh, mentally is once you take a step back from those good and bad thoughts and try to identify with the higher self um, that's viewing these thoughts, then you realize that's a thought in itself that you're identifying with. You know, so then it's just kind of a transposition into another form of a thought. And so when you when you try to do that, you try to find like you try to solve this unhappiness that you, you know, I think the main point of these religions and and the point of this mental improvement uh, of transitioning into a better person and becoming a better person, um, when you try to do that, you find that it's not possible. If it was possible, if there was a way to do it, people would do it all the time, you know what I mean? If we had, you know, if somebody has discovered a soul, then we would all try to have souls and and discover it ourselves but nobody has so in 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 going back to it with the the psychoanalysis once you have that guidance that moral guidance within your mental processes you separate yourself from the subconscious that makes those bad decisions and you try to use that moral guidance and find that you are unfulfilled and unhappy and meaningless so then you move towards that max power or pleasure Um, And that hunger, you turn, you know, that hunger turns you to trying to improve upon yourself or again, being transfixed with the idea of uh, how how to do it. So for Alan Watts, he mentions after realizing all these things, you know, he looks into psychology for the answer um, and then you know, he doesn't come to any conclusions with psychology. So then he comes to religion to find out their processes. Only to find out that they all end in the same inner game. Like, once you figure out your higher self, how do you get it working? You know, it's, it's each religion says ours is the best way to identify with your higher consciousness, right? So it's, it's like, you're chasing this thing because you're hungry and you want to feel fulfilled and you want to identify with the best self you can be, the person that's going to change the world and live up to their full potential. And so once you actually identify with your higher self, with the Eastern religious ideology, or you find out how to identify with God best, then that's only just the mental process. Then how do you get it working? Um, So each religion kind of says, you know, ours is the best way to identify with that better person, that higher consciousness. And then somebody comes along and says that they're all equal, and I'm much more tolerant than you are. (laughs) And then, of course, you know, you become a guru, and you say, well, I don't put other religions down. You know, it's just always constantly trying to find this way to one up and be that higher consciousness and comparing the consciousness to other consciousnesses and um, higher selves and uh, a way of grace. And then and then what? And then what do you do when you when you have this realization that all these that you're chasing this change that is impossible to find? Well, how do I not do that? (laughs) So it, it is. It, it's like, why do you want to know? What, like, why do you want to be better? Um, and of course, it seems obvious on the surface, but uh, there's a little parable that I actually heard from an Alan Watts, another Alan Watts lesson, and it, it's a story of a of an old man um, in ancient China or something, uh, living on a horse farm, right? And so he. He's living on a horse farm, and one of his horses runs away. And so, you know, the whole community comes over, and they're like, oh, I'm sorry to hear about your horse. That's kind of a sad thing that your horse ran away. And he goes, well, we'll see. And they're like, what? And the next day, the horse actually comes back with, like, seven or eight other wild horses that they found. Uh, And so, you know, all the people come back, and they're like, oh, well, that's great that it came back. And, you know, it's like, you got more horses. That's awesome. And he's like, well, we'll see. And uh, so the next day, you know, the son is out trying to work with the horses and trying to tame them or whatever. Um, and he ends up falling off in one of the wild horses and breaking his leg. And of course, everybody comes over and they're like, oh, man, I'm so sorry to hear about your son. Like, that's terrible. And he's, oh, you know, we'll see. And, uh, and then the next day, you know, the army recruiters come by, you know, or whatever the equivalent of army recruiters were back in the day to get his son for it to, you know, to go out and fight. But the son's leg was broken, you know. So it's just this constant cycle of things that you may think are good or bad in the moment. But in the end, it's like, how do you know what effect one bad thing or one good thing will lead to? And so that's kind of, it's like, how do you know what's actually good for you? Um, because if we knew, 
then you would be improved. <laughs> like, if we could print people, like, if we could make people print them out like the government prints money, <laughs> what type of people would we make? You know, like, if you, you, like, are you going to make a person with all these good values? Like, what are you, like, how do you know which values are important? Values change as time goes on. It's almost like uh, I watched this after school uh, video on YouTube about the history of, like, pesticides, right? And, and, you know, fertilizers. So you come across the Dust Bowl back in Dust Bowl times <laughs> in the 1900s. Then you come across this thing, uh, fertilizer, to make your plants grow more food and, and, and be more fruitful and generate more money and everything, right? Um, but then you find out that that fertilizer actually deteriorates their immune system, you know? And so we in turn we turn to the pesticides to get rid of the bugs. And then we find out the whole ecological thing, and it's a whole new set of issues. And, and again, it, it's the same psychologically. We don't know the way things are going to go, COVID, uh, so we don't know the type of people we should be to help improve the world. So, like, when you have an idea of what's good now, you just don't know if that's going to be good in the future. It's like, Many people thought that, you know, every person in war thinks they're doing the best thing for the world, which, again, it's who's to say that they're not. But in the end, virtue, real virtue shows itself. So coming back to the Alan Watts thing, the, the point he was kind of getting at, at least from my perspective, and he mentions this, he says the highest form of virtue is non-consciousness of virtue. And therefore, it is not a virtue, you know? Like, when, when you breathe, you don't congratulate yourself for breathing, but breathing is a good virtue nonetheless. So true virtue, at least, again, this is, this is me pulling conclusions from all of these different sources, and true virtue is the things that are. To use your senses or, you know, even like a, a plant's ability to heal itself is just things that are present and that, you know, that you really should try to connect with things that aren't conscious and 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 again that's completely paradoxical statement but again do, do you know of a revolution that set everything right according to the adam curtis documentaries and alan watts controlled anarchy seems to be the best form of a system so far that's what we've been doing for forever <laughs> and you know improving for the status as opposed to the actuality of improvement it, it's just like, you should run because you enjoy running. You shouldn't do it because you plan on being this amazing runner or because you think it's going to make you a better person. You should do it because, for the actuality, the virtue of the present moment. Like, why do I podcast? It's because I enjoy the sound of my own voice and I'm interested in what I'm saying a lot of the time, right? I don't do it for this overarching goal of trying to... Perhaps there is a part of me uh, that does have that thought of maybe my podcast will make an improvement in the world or somebody will hear something that I've put out and tr try to make better decisions. But in the end, it's really just for me. And I think an episode like this really <laughs> kind of nails that in the, you know, nails that in the, uh, nails the hammer in the coffin. What is the, fr it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I, the point is, I think an episode like this really shows that I'm trying to do this to collect my own thoughts and ideas and everything and 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 i don't know i like to the idea of like the scrapbooking element to it but again you should be doing things that you're doing because you enjoy them and you like the actuality and the present moment when you're doing them so you you find in realizing that improving yourself is futile right you realize that revolutions don't work out and sometimes individualism you can't change because Within young psychology, it's just that one problem reveals itself once you figure out another problem, one type of neurosis after another. So you find in realizing that the idea of like revolution or proving yourself is futile, then at that point it allows you to just kind of just watch, you know, like really identify with that present moment, those senses, because you don't know what you're going to do. People will watch and say, well, that's the external world, right? But is it, you know what I mean? Like, going back to that dude from the Adam Curtis doc, uh, Daniel Kahneman, 
the external world you're watching it right but is it really just the external world because there's so much happening in our brains like there's so much going on and and you have to not only watch the external world and your senses and your feelings but realize that the internal is almost just as out of your control neurologically it's all happening in your head like you Yes, you see the sun, but you only see the sun because your eyes in your head have receptors that transmit that into your brain, you know, same with smelling and hearing. It's just these vibrations that your brain turns into these things and makes sense of it, right? The real world isn't materialistic or spiritual. It's simply... Don't try too hard and plan to expect what happens. Just watch. And what happens is that you learn to express yourself through a technique. You use science or stand-up or music or whatever to express what you do. But beyond that, people who have become geniuses in their field fall short of explaining how they do it. Like, if they could explain how to become a genius, then we'd have everybody doing it. It's a lot. It's quite a bit. Um, I'm going to try to make sense of all that and try to make that as cohesive as possible, I guess, through editing and, you know, clarification uh, where I can. Um, But these are the things that I've had to explore uh, personally to kind of come to that conclusion of just watching, right? And just yesterday, I finished The Big Lebowski (laughs) for the third time. And... The ideology, the reason that the Big Lebowski ties into it is because I love the way he handles everything in that movie. The point of that movie is the dude abides. You see this laissez-faire type of approach to life where maybe, again, it's that idea of just watching. And so just accepting the things that you have control of and, you know, trying to improve for the better and, and enjoying what you have. And sometimes, you know, somebody comes and pisses on your rug Um, and you got to deal with it. Right. And and these things make you stray from your dude ideology of being a peaceful person uh, and induce stress and anxiety. Life throws plenty of obstacles that I'm sure you've all been through at you. Um, And in the end, what I gathered from that movie, but also from my experiences recently as I was going through these, it was almost, again, I'm mildly depressed and kind of feel like lost moving forward because I'm doing all these things and, you know, it's like, why do I feel I'm not living up to what I feel like I could be doing? Um, and, and you got to realize, like, it's just that, that, it's just coming back to that and, and realizing that trying to stay present and just watching and not stressing Again, from the Big Lebowski, it's you, you got to have people around you that remind you of that consistently and remind you actually who you are. And that's what I think best friends are good for. That's what I think family is good for. When I'm down, I always try to reach out to those people and they kind of set it straight for me and just be like, remember, you're just like a comic, dude. You're just chilling. You know, you're, a, you're like a stoner personality type and you are just chilling bro and and don't overthink everything like I always do so you know obviously all these things are more easily said than done but in the end it's it's just it's simply Thanks for listening this week, guys. I uh, hope you were able to keep up with uh, what I was trying to put out there. I know it's a lot. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that I know, like, going back and listening to it, there's some things that I don't even necessarily agree with or understand what I was trying to get across. But it's, it's just... 
it's hard sometimes when you're going on these tangents by yourself with the microphone in the room and there's nobody else there to, to check you uh, or to bring up a counterpoint or whatever. So I do acknowledge that. Um, I, I think this is more, the point is more to, it's not to sell you on any ide ideologies or anything like that. It's just to, you know, for something to think about. Food for thought, I guess. Also, I do want to say, you know, I, I realize I haven't been posting as frequently. Um, it, it's just time in my life right now. Uh, I always have a project that I've been working on. Like, I've been working on this episode for the past, like, four weeks. But uh, it just depends on the amount of time I can put towards editing and um, and then meeting new people. And I, and I think it'll uh, I'll come back more frequently as time goes on, as I meet more people, as it gets colder outside, spending more time inside. It's the whole thing. So, uh, anyways, as always, appreciate you listening. Check me out on Instagram, Steve McJ. Uh, I love you. Thank you. Amen. Okay, bye. So why are you hanging around?